own time. NMR now. This is where I want you all to pay 100% attention because this will 90, I think 100% either be in your HC or trials. And that's a very rare point I can make because there's so much content in chemistry that some content will just not be tested. But this I can almost guarantee will be either in your trials or in your HSC. So very high yield, you all pay attention. Good. Okay. So NMR spectroscopy stands for nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy, right? And what this tells you is a couple of things. We are studying a property of the nucleus. We're not looking at electrons. This is a property intrinsic to the nucleus, right? And it has to do with magnetic fields, which we're going to be talking about now, okay? And we know it's a spectroscopy technique, which indicates we're going to be exposing matter to light. Everyone with me? So we're going to be studying something about the nucleus by exposing atoms to light. Okay, very good. Now, NMR spectroscopy only works for atoms that have spin. So spin is the most fundamental property that must be present before we even say the word NMR spectroscopy. If an atom does not have spin, we cannot evaluate it under NMR spectroscopy. Now, spin, quite literally, think of it as spinning tops, right? If anyone's played Beyblades or, I don't know, Tarzos, all the spinning games, you literally think of atoms as spinning like that. Now, atoms can spin upside down or they can spin right side up, so normally, right? And this only happens for atoms that have an odd number of nucleons. So I want you to highlight this, right? Spin is a property that only atoms with an odd number of nucleons have. So if you think about this, hydrogen has 1.008 as its atomic mass units, which means it just consists of one proton. Do you all agree? One is an odd number, so the hydrogen atom will have the property of spin. It will be spinning. Okay, that's how you can think of this atomic property. Whereas, if we're talking about something like carbon-12, Srijit, how many protons and neutrons does carbon-12 have? Six each. So, can it exhibit the property of spin? No, so it no. won't have a magnetic field around it. Exactly. So, only hydrogen can. And if we want to study carbon, we'll have to study an isotope of carbon, which is carbon-13. That's why you might see carbon-13 NMR sometimes written in exam questions. That's because carbon-13 has an odd number of protons and neutrons, and thus will exhibit the property of spin. Now, just before we jump into spin and all the details here, a big use case of this that's being used every day to save lives is MRI imaging. Anyone know what MRI stands for? Magnetic resonance imaging. Very good. Right? And the same thing here, NMR is nuclear magnetic resonance. Resonance, all that is, is a phenomenon where spin keeps flipping up and down. And we'll talk about why that happens. That's what resonance means, right? When you think of something in resonance, you think of two states that are always changing. That's what resonance means, right? So MRI imaging, all that does is it uses powerful magnetic fields to flip the hydrogen atoms in your body. You all know you're 60% water, right? It uses powerful magnetic fields to flip the spin of hydrogen atoms in your water molecules. And when those atoms return back to their normal spin, they'll release energy that we pick up on imaging as your body, right? We use that to detect tumors, to stage cancers, to look at joints. It is the best imaging known to mankind, right? So just and understand why you're learning all of this. This is the chemistry application, but there's also a huge health application here. Good. So with spin, the way you think of it, like I told you, is that Atoms are quite literally spinning, and they can spin in an orientation that aligns with an external magnetic field. Now, when you, whenever you align with something, that's the low energy or least resistance configuration. Do you all agree? So aligning spin with an external magnetic field is the low energy configuration, right? However, let's say, Thorin, that I expose this atom in front of us to radio waves. The nucleons, the protons and neutrons, can absorb energy. And Tharun, what do you think they're going to do to the spin? They can flip it. 
Exactly. They can right. flip. And now what do you all notice? The spin is now against the external magnetic field. To go against something or to increase your resistance, you are in a higher energy configuration because you need that energy to remain and ensure that you have the resistance, right? And so when a nucleon and when atoms are aligned against an external magnetic field, we call this the high energy configuration. Makes sense. This only happens when the nucleus absorbs energy. And this is usually going to be in the form of electromagnetic radiation. In NMR, the energy source we always use is radio waves. Okay? So the energy source that will cause a nucleon or a nucleus to alter its spin to a high energy configuration is going to be radio waves. Sure. Good. Yes. Question? Yes. Uh, so if if in NMR they use radio waves to flip it, it uh, in to create a higher energy field, what do they use in MRI? In MRI, they use uh, these powerful magnetic fields directly. They don't shoot any any radiation at you. That's one of the oh. benefits of MRI. It's slightly different to this. That's why it's not called NMR. But uh, in MRI, they'll use a very powerful magnetic field that'll force all the atoms to go into another configuration, right? Which is going to be with the field. And eventually it'll flip yep. back and when it does a release energy. Yeah. Okay. For my physics students, isn't this a little bit of Lenz's law? Try and define yeah. Lenz's law. Um, when there's a current flowing, uh, there has to be a magnetic field opposing that initial change. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, good. Yeah, I'd say this is, they're all very intimate, all these laws. When you start looking at quantum physics and and chemistry, etc., there's the whole gravitational laws, there's the whole electromagnetic laws, there's the whole quantum theory laws. And I guess the whole role of physics is trying to unify everything. So yeah, it is, this is quite literally an application almost of Lenz's law, but at a very atomic level. Yeah, good. Now, key point here is that all atoms in a high energy configuration must return back down to their ground state, aka spin aligned with the field. When they do that, they must release energy, law of conservation of energy. When they go back down to low energy configuration, they must release that energy difference and they release it as frequencies of radio waves. We can pick that up and that can give us information about the sample. Now, what did I call this, everyone, where an atom is constantly flipping against and along the field continuously again and again and again? What is that called? Resonance. Resonance. This is so important. So you understand what nuclear magnetic resonance means. Now you should hopefully have an understanding of why we call it NMR spectroscopy. We are studying nuclei. We're studying the property of resonance, which occurs due to spin, and we're doing it under an external magnetic field nuclear magnetic resonance imaging. How easy is that? Right, so you now understand what the definition stands for. I'm going to explain things in a bit more detail now. Any questions so far? I thought you said it happens through radio waves. Yeah, it does, right? So they're in an external magnetic field. And when you are under an external magnetic field, Shreeji, they will align with the, the field, right? So I'm just going to draw the field lines in purple. So it has to be in an external magnetic field. In the external magnetic field, they will be exposed to radio waves that will flip them against the magnetic field oh, lines. Okay. That is the high energy configuration. Okay. They will then return back, orient themselves along the field lines, releasing those radio waves that we will pick up and then study. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So if you have no magnetic field, you don't really have a property of spin because spin is simply aligning to an external magnetic field. Good. So yeah, the two things you need, everyone, is you need an external magnetic field, you need a source of radio waves, you need something to measure the outbound radio waves when the nucleons return back to ground state. Very good. This is just another diagram, right? You can see this is a normal nucleon, it's just normal position. The second it's in a magnetic field, it orients itself. Do you all see that? And then when you supply it energy, it's going to flip against the field lines and it will return up and down. And the energy difference between the high and low states is either released or absorbed as energy, depending on whether it's exciting or de-exciting. Very good. This image is really good because it explains to you, just one second, I'm just going to quickly go through this part. 
the this really explains to you what NMR spectroscopy physically looks like. You can see the external magnetic field being produced. So this is going to be the field lines. This is a sample. It contains some hydrogen containing compound. It could be a ketone, aldehyde, hydrocarbon, carboxylic acid, but it has to be some compound containing hydrogen. So it has to be an organic compound, right? We have a radio wave frequency transmitter because I told you the other thing we need are radio waves. And then the radio waves released when the nucleus de-excites, I'll do that in blue, for example, is then picked up by a detector. And we'll use that to create an NMR graph that you'll be analyzing. Nielsen, question? Uh, it, it's kind of similar to like absorption and emission spectra, right? But very, like very photons. similar. The only okay. difference is it's not electrons, it's the nucleons themselves. Okay. Yeah. But otherwise, you're, you're completely right. It is quite literally the same. The, the only difference, although it's a very, very important difference, is it's not the electrons exciting and de-exciting, it is the protons themselves exciting and de-exciting. Okay. okay. Mr. Pordell, make sense? Uh, I don't, I'm a little bit confused. This. About what? You need to be able to clarify your confusion. So what are you confused about? Um, the resonance. <clears throat> okay. All resonance is, Saga, is when the nucleon is aligned against or with the field. So you see here, this is a normal state, right? Imagine, so you need to imagine that you are a nucleon, right? So you're a nucleus, pick a, we'll, we'll pick a compound that is very important, ethene. Let's say you're the nucleus of an ethene molecule. You've been rebirthed in the universe as an ethene nucleus, right? I put you in a magnetic field, you'll immediately, Saga, align with the magnetic field lines, right? That is just the lowest energy, lowest resistance state you can have. Make sense? Right? Then what I can do, Saga, is I can shoot radio waves at you, and your nucleus can absorb those radio waves and move to a high energy. Do you agree? Yeah. The high energy, Saga, is now, instead of being oriented with the field lines, you are now oriented yes, or against the field lines. Very good, right? Absorb that energy. Very good. Now, eventually, Saga, what comes up must come down. You've learned that with the flame test. You've learned that with AAS, right? And so when this reverts back to aligning with the field lines, do you agree energy must, energy has been lost. That energy must go somewhere, right? What does it get released as? Radio waves. That's it. And we just measure the radio waves and we create a graph based on that. But the thing oh. is, Saga, that atoms are doing this hundreds of times every second. In one second, they excite to high energy, they absorb that energy, they release it. They excite to high energy again, they absorb the energy, they release it. It keeps happening again and again and again over a period of investigation, let's say five minutes. But so, um, don't you put the external radio waves in first? And then does it just come back out? Yeah, it comes right back out. And then more radio waves come in, and then they come right back out, and they're detected. And it just keeps on happening. Oh, okay. Yeah, and so since that keeps on happening, scientists said, well, if you keep going up and down and up and up and down, then we're going to call that resonance. That's all it is. Make sense? Yeah. Good. Make sure you'll clarify your questions now, because once I start getting into things like shielding and, and splitting of signals, then it's just going to cause even more confusion. So any other questions at all? I have one. Yep. Uh, wait, with the radio waves, is the frequency the exact same always, or does it change? No, varying frequencies. We will shoot okay. radio waves in all the frequencies, and it will just happen to be Nielsen that when we hit a frequency, so going, coming up back here, Nielsen, right? Mm -hmm. It will just happen to be that when we hit a frequency that equals to the energy difference, so that's F, this is E equals HF, Planck's constant okay, yeah. quantization of energy formula, those of you who don't do physics just know this is a formula linking frequency of the wave to its energy. So when we shoot the radio wave that has the exact frequency that equals to the energy difference between the low, which is along the field line, and high energy state, then the nucleus will absorb that energy and move to its high energy state. Right? We don't know what that is, so we just shoot everything at it from low to high energy. So very good question. Good. Any other questions? 
Good. Wow. When I first learned this, I was confused. So the fact that you've all got this in 40 minutes, sorry, 50, about one hour is very good. Very impressive. 